Beyond the cellular paradigm, cell-free architectures with radio stripes. That is the topic of this video, and I'm Emil Björnsson. I'm an associate professor at Linköping University. And in this video, I will talk about first the basics of cellular communications, its properties and also its weaknesses, which tells us why we need to go beyond these type of networks and look at what we call cell-free networks and the basic of them. Then different ways of dealing with interference, these systems to provide you with a better performance. Implementation aspects in terms of radio stripes. And finally, I will give you some deployment examples. So what is a cellular architecture that I'm talking about? Well, that is what goes underneath all of the mobile communication networks that we have of today. And this is a idea that goes all the back to the 1950s. So Bullington in a paper from 1953 talked about the frequency economy in mobile radio bands. And another paper is from 1960, multi-area mobile telephone systems. And the whole idea here is that they were wanting to provide you with telephone services wirelessly over a big area. And they realized that in order to do that in a proper way, we need to divide it up into different sub areas, which we are calling cells. In each cell, we put an access point, AP, and this one is taking care of the services in each of these areas here. And they can communicate with each other through what we call a backhaul. And they also are connected to a core network that makes it possible for you to communicate with different people. So a person here can connect this access point, a person here can connect this access point, and if they want to talk to each other, well, then they go through the core network to do that, unless there happened to be a wireless backhaul in between these access points. So this is the basic of a cellular network. And the idea is to reuse the frequency or radio spectrum as frequently as possible in space. So we can do this by densifying the network, providing this network with smaller and smaller cells. And for example, two access points that are sufficiently far away from each other can use the same spectrum, and we can use the same spectrum potentially here. And if we are densifying the network by making the cells more or smaller, we can squeeze in uh, more access point in the same area, but still reuse the same spectrum in every fifth cell or something like that. And we control the interference then by having a fractional uh, spectrum reuse. So every fifth or every fourth cell or something like that is using the same spectrum. That is what was considered traditionally. And by densifying network and making it shorter distances between users and access points, we can also reduce the power as compared to a case where there will be much further between the different access points. So this is the type of network that we have today where we have these base station towers, we have base station on rooftops, and it's a quite visible installation. And that is on purpose because we want these base station or access points to see you as good as possible. At least they should be able to see a wall which is close to you so they can send the signal towards those who went and then reach you. And since they are sparsely deployed in the environment, at elevated locations, there will be large distance variations between users that are close and users that are far away from these access points. And that turns into large signal strength variations. So if you're close to the access point or you see it, you can get a strong signal and otherwise you will get a weak signal. And this also means that it's sensitive to blocking in the sense that if you happen to have a metal wall in between you and the nearest access point, you will get a much worse signal. Or if you sort of blocking the signal uh, with your hand around your mobile phone, that will also reduce the signal that is received. And what this leads to is large performance variations in networks. So here's a case where we have four access points deployed in an area. It's 1000 times 1000 meters. And these graphs here are showing the performance that you get in the network, measured in something called a spectral efficiency, bits per second per hertz. You multiply that with the bandwidth that they're using for communication, and then you will get the data rate in bits per second. So you have large values when you are close to one of the four base stations, and then you have small values. And you see these large variations, if you're lucky, you get 
a large number, but most locations have quite a mediocre performance. And because these cell networks were designed for voice calls, where you have a fixed service quality, you just need to make sure to put up this access point frequently enough so that the blue performance down here is enough to make a phone call. And then you don't really benefit from being up in these peaks. And as we identify the networks, in this case, we have instead of four, we have 16 access points. We see the same type of behaviors. Same shape, it's just that every peak like this becomes smaller. So there's a lot of locations where you're due to interference, for example, are getting bad quality. But as long as you're interested in voice services, it's enough to be done here. However, nowadays we are using this network for data communications, which means that if you are up here, if you're close to an access point, you will get a good data rate. And when you're down here, you will get the poor one. So now we are noticing these variations a lot. That's also when you see that you get interruptions in your data streaming, some things like that. So what we would like to achieve wirelessly is that we can guarantee the same good service quality everywhere. So considering once again an area like this, we would like to have almost the same high performance everywhere. There will naturally be some variations depending on where you are, how close you are to the access point, but this is what we like to achieve. And the reason for that is that users request the same service everywhere. So if you are in the center of the cell, you can easily get the service that you need. And you only need to have your mobile phone turned on uh, in fractures of time. While if you are at the edge of the cell, so you're down at one of those blue areas, well then you need to have the phone turned on all the time and you might not even get the service that you need. So for that reason, most of the active users are actually at the edges of the cell. So by improving the service quality at the edge of the cell, we can improve the entire network. So can we somehow achieve performance that looks more like this than in those peaks that we considered earlier? Well, people have been trying to do this in the past. In the 4G systems, there were an idea called coordinated multipoint transmission. That was an attempt to solve these issues that has to do with interference between the different access points. So here is a conventional cell network. We see that we have access point put out at some different locations and we have users at different locations as well. And users that are close to an edge of the cell, they are the ones getting bad performance. And the idea with coordinate the multipoint transmission was that let's take some of the neighboring access points and put them together to a joint cooperation region, creating something like this. So here we have three access points that we now put together into one region. Another three here gives you this region. So this is a cellular network still, but we have these cooperation clusters. And we can implement this in different ways. We can make sure that the different colored regions here are coordinating when they are serving different users, or they can try to direct signals towards users with what's called beamforming, so that we are not sending too much interference into another colored region when we are serving users at a particular place. Or the most advanced method here is what's called joint transmission, where the access point in the region like this are jointly from all of the access point transmitting to a particular user. However, this was not a successful solution, so it hasn't really been used much in practice. And there are several reasons for that. One thing is that there, uh, in the way it was implemented, you had to send a lot of information between these access points that belong to the same colored region. And it was also hard to standardize these type of methods because usually there is no standardized protocol between how these access points should communicate with each other so uh, that you can have different access points from different companies and it will still work out fine. What was instead considered when we were creating 5G is a concept called massive MIMU. That was an attempt to improve the spectral efficiency in 5G networks instead. And there, the concept was that instead of having one high gain antenna that is sending the signal towards the coverage area of an access point uh, and having always the same directivity, we were going to having many small low gain antennas. Each of them are radiating in many, many directions, but by putting them all together and 
deciding how they are sending the same signals for different time delays, we were able to create these kind of beamed uh, transmissions in different directions. So this is called Massey MIMO, where MIMO stands for multiple input, multiple output, describing these multiple antennas that we have in the system. In this case, there are 64 of them. And it's called massive because we have a large number of antennas, let's call it N. And it should also be much larger than the number of beams or number of uses that we try to serve at the same time. So the idea with massive MIMO was that we send a strong signal uh, with a much more narrow directivity than before. We can serve uses at different locations and we can provide them with stronger signals without necessarily cause more interference to neighboring users or neighboring cells, so we can reduce interference. So this is a topic that I've been working with a lot, and you can find many other videos on YouTube on this topic. But can we, with this massive MIMO technology, deliver uniformly good service to everyone in the cell? Well, massive MIMO handles more users and gives them stronger signals, but many problems still remain. So if this was a type of setup that we've seen before, well, with massive MIMO, we can increase the reading close to a base station where we get this maximum spectral efficiency that the system is supporting. In this case, it's eight. And then we can improve the performance at the edges of the cell and we can get so that wherever you are, you get better performance than in previous technologies. But we still have these large variations. And if we are in 5G systems considering millimeter wave bands, which is one of the new features of 5G, well, then we won't get something like this. We will have a much poorer performance at the cell edges because those signals are not even propagating as well as before. So 5G is improving for everyone, but it doesn't provide you with this uniformly good service for everyone. So what can we do instead? And that leads us to the topic of this talk moving beyond the cellular paradigm. So before we had the cellular network, we divide the region into different cells where we have a base station, maybe with a massive number of antennas that are serving the users. But instead of doing it like that, let's not divide the area into sub regions that we call cells, but just spread out access points. So each of these ones is an access point. And these access points are connected via these cables that we call front pole to a central processing unit. And together they are collaborating to serve all the users in this entire region. We have a massive number of distributed antennas here. And wherever you are in the region, you will have a relatively short distance to at least some of the antennas that we have deployed. The connection to massive MIMO here is that we have a large number of antennas. They are now spread out instead of uh, put on some discrete locations. And we have many more than we have uses that we are gonna serve in this area. So this is called cell-free network or cell-free massive MIMO. So what is the difference between this new cell-free architecture and what we considered in 4D, coordinated multipoint, where we also had distributed access point that are collaborating and serving users? Well, in this case, we were taking on a network-centric design, meaning that we let some of the neighboring access point collaborate, but we are dividing them into disjoint sets. So this user here is served by this free access point in the red region, but it can still get interference from these ones. And this one user here in the red region can get interference from a number of other access points. So every user is not served by the surrounding ones, but just a selected ones that was paired together in the network design. And what cell-free networks are about instead is that each user should be served by all access points that are in the area of influence for him. So this user is served by all these access points here. This user is served by these ones. This user is served by what is the shaded area there and so on. And you can see that this area of access points that are uh, serving a particular user are overlapping. So we kind of divide it up into disjoint regions like this. That is what we mean that it's cell-free. And it's also a user-centric design, meaning that it's a user to decide which access point that is going to serve it based on which ones are needed to provide it with a good service and control all interference in the system. So to 
understand a little bit better how this works, let's first look at the uplink from the users to the access point and look at the philosophy of interference rejection. So if we start with the cellular network, say that we have one user here, one user here, one user here. They are sending signals to their respective access points. So we have one desired signal here, one here, one here. But each of the access points is only interested in one of them. So this receiver here makes one observation, which is the sum of the signal coming from different places. But one of them is a desired signal, and two of them are interfering ones. And it only makes one observation, which means that it cannot just get one of the signals out of that without getting interference from the two other ones. So we have too few observations to reject interference, and we are going to have to live with that interference that we have in the system. In the cell-free, the idea is instead that we have the same usage that are sending information, but instead of having access points here that are working individually, they are together jointly decoding the signals. And now we have free access points, so we have free observations. We also have free decide signals. And from free observation, we can extract free signals. That's like solving a linear system of equations, for example. So in this case, we can deal with interference. In this one, we can't. So in cell networks, we are much more limited in terms of how we can deal with interference than in a cell free network. Moreover, if you look at the downlink, why would we ever like to transmit from more than one point to a user? Well, let's look at a case here. We have two access points, AP1 and AP2. Both of them have the same gain or path loss. We call it beta to this user. And say that we are allowed to transmit with a power of P. Since both of them have the same beta value here, uh, why just not just pick one of them, AP1, and transmit with all the power from that one? Then we get the power P times the channel gain beta. That is how much we are going to receive. If we are instead using both of these access points, they are sending with half of the power each, so p over 2 from each of them. And then they are sending the signal in such a way that they are adding up constructively at the location of the user. What will then happen is that we look first in the amplitude domain, where p over 2 is square root p over 2, and the gain is square root of beta. We get one term from the first access point, another one from the second access point. Then when we have added them up, we go to the power domain by taking it to the power of 2. And what we now get is 2 times p beta. And this 2 times is due to this coherent combination of the signals. These two access points are sending the signal, so they're adding up constructively at one particular location where the user is. And that is the reason why we are going to transmit from multiple points to a user. It's sort of a counterpart of beam forming, but for distributed access point. And even if one of them have a worse beta than the other one, it can still pay off to transmit from both of these locations and making sure they're adding constructively. So here's an example of how this really works. So here I put it out a large number of access points along the walls in the square room, and it's from zero to five wavelengths. And then I have a user at this location, and I am sending the signal so they are adding up constructively at that particular location. And the color here, or the height, is showing how strong the signal is going to be. And at the point of location uh, of the user, we get a very strong signal. And at most other cases, we are places here, we are getting a much worse signal. And if we are looking now from above, what you will see is that we have a signal that is focused on just a point of the user. And we can see here, it's roughly half a wavelength in diameter. So in 3D, this will be like a ball of half a wavelength in diameter where we have a strong signal and everywhere else we don't have a strong signal. Okay, so how would we now implement something like this? So what we will have in the cell for network is we have a core network that takes care of all of the services, connects us to the internet so we can download videos or other things. Then this core network is connected to different 
central processing units, each of them, them being directly connected to several different access points. And then we have users that prefer different sets of access points. And we will call these central processing units for CPU and the access point for AP. And when we are operating the system, there is a number of different processing tasks, signal processing that we would like to carry out. We would like to estimate the channels from a user to different access points. We would like to do what we call pre-coding, that is when we are adding uh, the, up the signals constructly at a particular user by adapting the time delays or phase shift from these different access points that are transmitting to them. And we can also use this to limit interference. And we also would like to do the data encoding when we transmit or data uh, decoding when we are receiving the signals. And we can operate this in different ways. We can consider a centralized version where we try to do as much as possible at these different CPUs. So when it comes to a particular user, in the downlink the data is encoded here, then it's sent uh, to the different access points which are just transmitting. This CPU is determining how to transmit. And when another access point is being involved in serving this user here, uh, then we can, through this network, decide how we should operate the system. So here, everything is done at CPUs, and this access point is just measuring signals and send them up, and then the uh, CPUs are telling you how to operate the different systems. Another option, which is the distributed options, is that each access point tries to do as much processing as possible. It learns the channel from the user to the access point, and it decides on how to send the signals, uh, which time delays to use there, and how to deal with the signals when you have received them, uh, how to make sure that we can combine the signal from different access points properly. Then when we have done our pre-processing in the uplink, we send the signal to the CPU, which is fusing the signals, and then downlink the uh, access points are getting the data from the CPU, but nothing else than that. So these are the two different versions, centralized or distributed implementation of stuff like this. I mentioned channel estimation multiple times now. The access point needs to know the channel from the user to itself so that it knows how to pre-code a signal when it transmits to them in order to make the signals from different access points add up constructively. And in the uplink, it needs to do the opposite type of operations in order to make it possible for you to fuse the information on multiple access points and make them reinforce each other. And when the channel estimation was implemented in 4G coordinated multipoint systems, that was why it didn't work out properly, because there were a lot of information that needed to be sent between the different access points to make it work. Here, in the cell-free networks, we are thinking from the beginning how to design the channel estimation in order for it to be as lean as possible. And the conclusion is that we should operate only in time division duplex mode, which means that we are communicating in the downlink from the access point to the user and in the uplink from the user to the uh, access point on the same frequency band. And by dividing them in time, we can make sure that we have the same channel in the uplink as in the downlink. We just switch uh, often enough. So we can learn this channel at the access point by letting the users send a pilot signal, a known signal in the uplink, which allows you to, to estimate the channels. And now there is no need for the access point to share any information between them but because it gets everything that it needs, all the channels from users to itself. That is what you can estimate from the uplink pilots. So how does this work in practice? Well, we have the channel is varying in time and in frequency. And we shop up this time frequency grid into frames, which are such that the channel is not varying over the frequency domain within the frame and not in time domain either in one frame. And then you do uplink first and then downlink in each other frames. And in the beginning of the uplink, we send a pilot signal and the rest of it can be divided between the uplink and the downlink uh, for data in whatever way you like. So let's now look at the performance that we can get and compare the cell-free setup with the cellular setup. So we're considering a one kilometer times one kilometer system. We have 400 access point antennas and 40 users in this network. So we see these large variations, many more antennas and users. And 
we will consider a self-free setup with 400 access points on the grid, 20 times 20 square grid. And we will consider both the centralized and distributed processing that I was mentioning. Then we will consider two different cellular setups. One where we have four access points, one, two, three, four, uh, all of them with 100 antennas. So this is a kind of massive MIMA setup. Or we have small cells. We have the same 400 access point as here, but each of them is only serving uh, the users in this neighborhood without collaborating. So we are creating a cellular network of the same kind. And we consider a 3DPP urban microcell model. It's uplink, 20 megahertz, 100 milliwatt of power, and you can find all the details in this paper. We present the performance in the uplink here in terms of the spectral efficiency in bits per second per hertz. And there is a CDF or cumulative distribution function of that. That means that we drop the users randomly in the area and then we see what performance they're getting. And we are plotting here the performance variations, which you see are quite large. And uh, for example, if you look at here 0 0.5, then the point that we get here is that 50% of the users are getting worse performance than this number. And the other 50% is getting a higher number. And that means that we would like a curve to be as far to the right as possible. That means better performance. The cellular case here, the massive MIMO case, is to the left, which means that it's always the worst performance here for most of the users, except up here where it starts to cross with other curves. The cellular small cell approach is better in most cases, except when uh, you are among the most uh, luckiest 20% of the users, then the seller set up uh, with massive MIMO is better because that's happened to be the 20% of the users that are very close to one of those access points. However, the rightmost curve here is none of the cellular curves. It's the cell-free centralized approach where almost everyone is getting a very high performance. There are still variations between the users, but you're guaranteed a very good performance and the distributed case have a similar trend. So if we look at the, this curve here, 0 0.9, that means that 90% of the users are getting this performance or higher. Then we see that we have first massive MIMO, then small cell, then the distributed cell-free, and then the centralized cell-free setup. So the cell-free setup is improving this so-called 90% likely performance that 90% of the users are getting. And we can go down to 95%, we see the same type of trend. The centralized version of it provides you with the best performance, much better than the other ones. The distributed approach uh, increases definitely the worst case performance. So in this massive MIMES setup, 90% of users are getting uh, two bits per second per hertz or higher, while with the distributed method, we get 3.5 or something like that. But we still have some of the users that will be better off with our systems. So this is what really what we like to do, improve the performance for the uh, least lucky ones in the network. So there's just one problem when it comes to deploying cell-free networks, and that is we are easily creating a so-called spaghetti monster by having these uh, CPUs in the center, and then we have a long, long cables uh, to different access points being here at the outmost point of the spaghetti. And this is really why people also have been not so interested in deploying these things in reality. The solution to that is, however, something that has been recently invented. Namely, to instead of having a dedicated cable to every antenna, we are instead considering what we call a serial front hall, going from the CPU to one access point, then to another one, then to another one, another one. You can view this as saying that, okay, I would like to put an antenna here and I have my CPU here. And along the way, let's put out multiple access points on the same cable. And this is what is called a radius stripe. So this is an implementation architecture for cell-free networks. So we have a central processing unit on one side of this stripe, we can, which you can view as a cable or a flat tape stripe. And then you have a cable here that provides you with the power and the front hall. We have antennas at different locations. So the antenna elements are 
going out here and then all the processing are being made in these antenna units. And depending on the frequency range, we can either have in 3.5 gigahertz band uh, antennas that are going out of the cable, or we can at 10 gigahertz put all the antennas inside of it. And when we go up to higher and higher frequency, we can put more and more antennas inside the cable of itself. This is a concept that was invented by Linship University in collaboration with Ericsson. And we can essentially create as long stripes as possible as long as we can deal with the power consumption. And I will come back to that. So here's an idea how that type of uh, radio stripe can look like. Where are we going to use these ones? Well, we could, for example, consider places where you can't put up a base station of the day. So here is a cultural place where we would not be able to put up base station because it, they are looking ugly. But there are many different cables or uh, lamp posts and so on where we can put up something like this, make it invisible just as a cable. So this is a case where we can't put up uh, a cell network of the day. Then there are cases like factories where we would like to have very, very good reliability. And in order to provide that in an area like this with a lot of machines, a lot of noise, a lot of blocking elements, uh, then we can put up these radio stripes in the ceiling everywhere and provide you with the connectivity that you need to have a very good performance in a setup like this and not this large variation that we saw before. And in cases with very many users, like a stadium, then we can put up these radio stripes at many different locations and provide uh, the uh, coverage that we need without having large variations. When we have decided to put up a radio stripe and use that architecture, we can actually make use of the architecture to improve the processing. And that is what is called sequential processing. So think about, we have a user that sends a signal S to free access points, and they are deployed along this radio stripe. And here we have the CPU. Then the first access point will make an estimate S hat one, and send this estimate of the signal to the next access point. Then this access point is taking that signal and what it received itself, create a new improved estimate, S hat two, and send that one to the third access point, which is combining it with the information that it already had itself. It makes another improved estimate, S hat three, and send that one to the CPU, and potentially it will receive some input from another radio stripe as well. And the idea here is that we have fewer cables because they're sharing one cable instead of having three of them. And every segment of this cable have the same front hall requirements, the same capacity, the same amount of data need to be sent there as if there would only be one access point on this front hall. So it doesn't grow with the number of access points. We are always fusing information from one side and put it together to send on our new improved information. And you can read more about this in the paper that is from ICC 2020. Let's now look at what goes into these radio stripes. So we have antenna elements here and they are connected to an APU, an antenna processing unit. And inside that one, we have everything that we are used to having in a transceiver chain. There is the DSP, a digital signal processor. Then we have DA and AD converters and IQ mixers and other things, power, small power amplifiers here. They are connected to different antennas. And between the different APUs, there is an internal connector providing it with power and with frontal connectivity and a clock reference that comes from the CPU on one side of it. And around the stripe, there is a protective material. Think about the casing of a cable, for example. And since we are looking at cases where you're gonna put up these antennas relatively close to where the users are, not at very elevated locations. We can operate with much lower power, uh, maybe far below what your mobile phone is using today. So that means that every power amplifier needs to work with relatively weak signals and everything here can be done in a much simpler way than on the high power base station of today. So think about cell phone grade transceivers and not something more fancy like than this. And this internal connector can be based on, for example, power of Ethernet, which can uh, then be based on existing standards, 
you can definitely build a radio stripe that's 100 meter of length and provide you with enough power to operate it. The important thing is you design each of these components for this particular purpose and not taking off the shelf hardware for more high power use cases. Let me now wrap up with a short summary of the many benefits that cell-free architecture and radio stripe is having. So first, it's a good service for everyone that we are are looking for by putting up antennas everywhere and using this new architecture in order to be able to provide you with this uniformly good performance. And we are building it to have a modular way we can put up more radio stripes when you want to and only have the small components that you need and nothing more. Hopefully we can even build this with print electronics sometimes in the future. Flexibility in terms of many use cases, I was exemplifying the factory, the stadium and the cultural places and you can find many other places where you can put up a radio stripe like this. And they're designed for scalability so that you can have very long radio stripes, very many of them, you still can build a cell-free network. And you will reduce the cost as compared to regular base stations which are very expensive while you will hopefully be able to buy a radio stripe here for just a few dollars should be easy to install so everyone who can put up a cable could also put up a radio stripe and practically invisible you don't think about all the cables that are in different buildings in the same way you can put up radio stripes to provide you with a uniformly good service everywhere without seeing that you actually have radio equipment there so if you're interested in learning more you could read the first paper on the topic our overview paper and some of those technical papers that figures from this video was taken from. And finally, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors here. Many of them come from Linship University or Ericsson, who has worked with, together with me on this topic.